from the February uh, February meeting. I'd entertain a motion then. Move to approve. Do I have a second? Yep. Second by uh, Councilman Heidi. Uh, those in favor, signify by raising your right hand. Five to nothing. Board of Works minutes for uh, information only. Uh, we have no public hearings tonight. No communications. Department reports. Uh, Fire Chief Butler. I kept the packet together because I got other stuff in there in minutes. So I just labeled it with you. Yeah. Good evening. Good evening, Chief. Good evening. Uh, last month's report for February 2017, structure fires, one in the city, <coughs> snow fires, one in Richland Township, unauthorized burns, one in the city, mutual aids, one in Henry Township, auto fire alarms, one in Rochester Township, field fires, one in Rochester Township, accidents, two in the city, two in Rochester Township, one in Newcastle Township, gas leaks, one in the city, medical assist, we had 14 in the city, Three in Rochester Township, one in Richland Township. We drove the ambulance twice. We had one cancel call to Liberty Township. Uh, 31 runs and one drill. Pending your questions, that concludes my report. Anyone uh, have any questions for the chief? Thank you, Tom. Thank you. Oh. Chief Shots. <laughs> Good evening. Good evening, Andy. Uh, for the month of February, we had a total of 10 accidents, one of those being personal injury. We issued 102 total warnings. We had 59 total offenses, 41 case reports, 575 calls for service, 26 lockouts, 7 towed vehicles, and 23 people incarcerated. And then you have the crimes. That's what those people were lodged for. Do you guys have any questions about those? Our numbers are up for the first two months as compared to last year. Um, I don't know why, but they are. Um, and they are up from January because we've got two officers back from the cab. Um, so that equates for some of that. Um, I'm sure you guys are aware, but uh, Shroff and Wood are back from the academy. Um, and we're accepting applications until April 14th and then we'll we'll see how it goes from there um, it, it, you never know right now we did, we've only got about three turned in but there's been about 30 that have been handed out so typically that last push that last week we'll get a, a, a push and most people get them turned in then so uh, we haven't set a date for testing yet we we kind of want to evaluate because we're going to have to hire two um, with Norris leaving and then we still haven't filled Burton's position. Um, we'll just see how it goes. We'll see how many are turned in and, and then we'll, we'll evaluate from there and either extended or set testing date. Yeah, it, it should be noted because I've had some folks asking, <laughs> why do we have the turnover that we have? And the chief and I have talked about this. Uh, <laughs> It isn't pay uh, per se. Uh, we are paying better than a second year state policeman. Mm -hmm. uh, and around the area of municipalities we compete with, we, we have a pretty good pay situation. Uh, I've ridden with these folks. We've done exit interviews with all of them. And uh, this is kind of what happens. And correct me if I'm wrong, Chief. When a young person graduates from a college in uh, law enforcement uh, they want to be an officer the first thing they do is go on the internet and see if they're hiring where they want to be and in most cases the couple that I have exit interviewed they wanted to be around their home area officer Burton wanted to get back to the Carmel area and officer Norris wanted to get to the Bloomington area actually he's going to be a <coughs> campus policeman for IU uh, if there's no available spots in those areas, then they look for the closest area they can to go to apply. 
And unfortunately, when you have an officer that comes in with that in mind, uh, Rochester becomes bridge employment. What I mean by that is they're here until that vacancy becomes available where they would really like to be. So we, we've kicked this around and with uh, Officer Wood and Officer Shrove, uh, we added some new criteria and that was uh, roots to the community. Uh, so, you know, we've got that in our criteria for searching now, trying, <coughs> trying to, uh, to find people, pick people who have family, who, who, who are invested in the community in some way. And there won't be then a less, more likely than not to have the bridge employment situation. Is that a fair assessment? Yeah, I'd say so. <clears throat> and try to get our officers in, invested in the community after they're hired. Right. Try to get them involved. Right. I know a lot of us are involved in sports, coaching, and, and things like that. So, yeah, I mean, once you're involved with the community, it makes it home. And that's all we can hope for. Officer Wood, for example, has uh, a family. Uh, he has purchased a home uh, out on Park Road. Uh, kids are entrenched in the community. Uh, he says he's going to be here. He's gonna, this is going to be his community. Um, Officer Dennison, who's a young single policeman, uh, ridden with him, talked to him, and his comments are, uh, well, you know, I have a girlfriend from the big city who's going to be moving up here. Our plans are to be here in this community, and she doesn't want me to be a police officer in Indianapolis. She thinks more of me than that. So, okay, you've got, uh, got that going for you, too. There is a certain amount of safety for a police officer in uh, Rochester, Indiana, as opposed to in Indianapolis. Mm -hmm. So you've got that, and you, you think, okay, that person's going to be vested. Elaney Shrove, of course, those of you who know Elaney, she has family here in the community, and uh, uh, we believe Elaney's going to be around for a while, quite a while. So those are kind of things you got to look at, too. Um, because we, we, we don't want to be in a re revolving door process. Absolutely. <coughs> I couldn't agree more. We get tired of training them, too. Oh, we do. <laughs> we do. Yeah. And the cost. I yeah. was going to say, I don't like writing the checks. Right. The cost is bad. But there's no way you can keep someone here, either, and have well, a contract. Well, you can't tie them here. No. No. But we can... We can take a look at some other things besides uh, the basic criteria that we yep. look at. Uh, any other questions for the chief? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Warren Lease is ill. And Derek is uh, out of town. So that brings us to uh, Lenny. Lenny Conley, Street Department. <laughs> Uh, Derek did leave a copy of his report on your. Is she on vacation again? Is she on vacation again? Is she on vacation again? No. Mother in law is ill. Good evening. Good evening. Um, well, at the street department, we've been uh, cleaning storm drains as it is getting into the wet season. Um, we ran the recycling route, ran downtown and parked trash receptacles. Been picking up bags, patching holes. We chip brush. <laughs> He's winking at me because I, I picked said, up small Don't piles start with brush. chip brush. You always start <laughs> with chip brush. Break it up a little. <laughs> <laughs> we uh, mixed up 145 tons of yeah, salt and sand to fulfill our 2016 quota. Um, Shot and I uh, got together and submitted our name in the pool for the 2017 big quotes for salt. Uh, I've been working on street signs, and that's all we have. I have for the street department. Any questions? Uh, have you been in touch with the NB? Uh, I, I got in touch with them today about that the parking lot. Yeah. And, uh, uh, he's working up another quote to make sure it's still the same uh, as what it was last year. And he's supposed to get back with me either Friday or Monday. Okay, that's um, for the senior citizens. Mm -hmm. that's, that's the first on our list this year. Yeah, and uh, he he's breaking it up in two different quotes. 
Yeah. And then the, the, the gather quote. To, but anyway, uh, yeah, I got with him uh, this morning. So. Okay. Good. <clears throat> but uh, I have a few things for the park. Um, everybody's back to work now today. Uh, started Monday, back to work. Um, the bathrooms are now cleaned and operational. Uh, all the water is turned on. And then I'd like to give a shout out to a couple of uh, groups. Um, Jeff Markley and Brian Tom Thomas uh, are spearhead the correctional workers and um, they've been out cleaning up the park and doing uh, a few uh, numerous acti other activities throughout the city and I'd just like to give them a, a thank you for all that they've done. And uh, also um, uh, Joe Koch and Rick Benush of REMC, I'd like to uh, give them a thank you as well for uh, fixing the lights at Fansler Park that was uh, dangling down about to fall. Uh, they came and removed them for us and they've helped us with other uh, community projects and I'd just like to uh, say thank you to them as well. Very nice, very good. And that's, that's all I have. Any questions for Lenny? Any 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 uh, progress on the disc golf? Uh, uh, the, well, I do have the baskets. Uh, they're down at the uh, main depart, uh, street department and um, just waiting on Kyle to see what he's got going on, but we're getting closer. Okay. <coughs> Thank you. Thank you. Well, how's your game, Mayor? What's your game? game? Yeah, game. <coughs> golf game. Yeah, the golf swing's gone now to be carpal tunnel. You know? <laughs> <clears throat> okay, reports of committees. Uh, uh, well, we've got the Area Planning Commission first with Councilwoman uh, Miller. The Area Planning Commission last, met last evening and the first discussion was the landscaping and the design of the West 9th Main Street Park. And I think Casey's going to be speaking further on that tonight, so I will not go further into that. Um, and then we also uh, discussed and had approval on a few things from outside the city and in the county pertaining to Kiwana, Fulton, Akron, and then also some redefinition of land in Rochester, or property in Rochester, the Grace, uh, church will be redefined uh, from residential cluster to institutional recreational on a proportion of land on a portion of land that they have south and south of the church south of the first east portion of the church that sits right there on the street and then dr. Fromfelder will also go from residential to uh, HD which is I've just now forgotten yeah, okay, there you go, uh, for his office property there. The others were out of town. If you're interested in them, I can tell you, but they were for Kiwana, Fulton, and Akron. Anyone? Okay, all right. And that was about it, and we closed our meeting. Any uh, questions for Karen? Okay. And uh, Brian's not here, so we'll ask Gary about that. Go. Sure. You asked me about FEDCO, and I was going to ask Karen about the Planning Commission meeting last night with the park at 9th and Main, assuming things went well with that last night. Um, looks like we have locked in a, uh, some proposals on all the aspects of completion of the park. Um, I'll be talking with the Executive Committee for FEDCO on Thursday morning, looking for the approval to go forward and sign contracts, uh, maybe as soon as, as Friday. Um, and then we have a, a great uh, visual from uh, uh, one of the contractors uh, that looks like a really, it's going to be a really nice space. Uh, we've spent several months, a small team, working on design elements for it and getting things together that it's going to be an asset that we can all be proud of in the community. Um, so hopefully we can sign some contracts this week and get it on a schedule to get completion. Amy is pushing me for the uh, 24th weekend of June. Uh, we'll see about that, but uh, we hope to have it on a work schedule pretty soon. So any questions or thoughts on that? Is that, what do we call that? Is that a video concept? Is that what that yeah, is? Yeah. yeah, so it's a, a mock-up basically of a walk through the park uh, with all the amenities. Casey says no. <laughs> in case you want to call it. Better terminology, nomenclature on that. 
It is. It's a it's a video, a 3D rendering of the park, um, but it's just a proposed draft until everything is signed. Okay, got you. Uh, we have, um, we'll be applying to the Community Foundation for a grant there. We'll be um, using some of the Rochester Redevelopment Commission funds. We have uh, about 25000 in private donations um, to move it forward. So I think we'll move that forward pretty soon. I think starting pretty soon. So, um, good deal on that. <clears throat> Just to let the council know, working on a, uh, if you're not already aware, there's a wind development company that's looking at a, rather large project in south and western Fulton County, parts of northern Cass County and uh, northern Miami County. Um, so there are land agents looking at contracts and so forth. I don't know if that was on the Planning Commission agenda. You mentioned the project in Kiwana, but uh, one company, RES Energy uh, Colorado, that's looking at a wind project there. Um, the company we did business with that we actually sold the Fedco property to in Kiwana, uh, Jess Daly, Daly Farms out of the Star City area. Uh, looking at a small uh, two million ga gallon annual production butanol facility. We're looking for sites um, between Kiwana and Rochester. They like 31, but we have a, a spot or two in Kiwana that might work for them. So we're trying to help them locate some real estate. Um, on the small business side, um, I put in you guys in the green folder there uh, some information that we have on our small business development program with Fedco. Uh, some of the numbers in terms of the um, amount of money that we've been able to loan to businesses, um, just over 300000 <clears throat> with some loans made late last year. We're applying to uh, USDA for additional revolving loan funds of $99,000 that we'll get the application in on pretty soon. The, the board uh, signed a corporate resolution for us to apply for those funds, uh, so we'll have more uh, uh, funds to lend out pretty soon. Um, we've run... Uh, 93 students through our business planning and management course. We actually have a meeting right now with four um, businesses to be. They're small business startups that are looking to go into our next level program class that's starting next week. And they're also, um, we think that one thing that's important in our community, especially some of the small rural towns, is um, restaurants, cafes, um, that kind of thing. So we're actually doing a, uh, a three part training just for restaurant businesses uh, throughout the county. I think we have five businesses that have signed up so far, three within the county and two from outside Fulton County that are coming in for this training. Um, and that's all I was gonna cover on the Fedco side until the Redevelopment Commission report, so. You wanna just, Terry. there's less than anything else. I'm sorry. Uh, on the wind farm, mm -hmm. are you free to discuss at all how many locations that might be in Fulton County? I, I don't have those numbers off the top of my head, Marty. It, 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 in the area, um, it's a significant number. I mean, in the whole project, it's about a third of the project size, I believe. So, it's in a little less than a third, but yeah, it's in Fulton County. Okay. How many can be established per acre? I don't know the specifics on that. It's kind of early, I think, in the process. Casey may even have additional information. Um, I couldn't, I don't do the math. Could do the math in my head. I mean, there's setbacks on each one of them. Yeah. And that would probably, if they could do them back to back to back, I mean, that would be how you calculate it. Like Steve Metz or gave like an initial amount. I'm not sure if we're allowed to say that out loud, but. I would I, let Brian Lewis speak to that. I would say if I had the information, I would have it with me. I'm sorry. Uh, but I can get it to the council and, uh, you know, it's. Yeah. 96 it, it's, is the original <clears throat> Yeah, we, we have the wrong commissioner here tonight. You're needing 90, <laughs> she's needing 96 acres or they're needing no, 96, 96 windmills? Wind okay. Yeah, I was thinking 100, but. Yeah, I think you yeah. said around 96. Just curious. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, we can get you more information on that. And you want to go right into the redevelopment? Uh, I'm sure. Um, we have worked through um, changing part of the Rochester Tip District, as you guys may recall. We are at that process where there is a. Um, resolution that the council needs to approve. Uh, the public hearing was held. Um, <clears throat> there was no public attendance. Uh, the idea is to delete the old rail lines out of the Rochester Redevelopment Commission um, TIF district. Uh, we've had some uh, requests from the county uh, to do that. And so we've gone through the Redevelopment Commission, the Plan Commission, the City Council, the public hearing, City Council again, and then the Redevelopment Commission will meet at their meeting next week to um, finalize everything. So. I need um, 
review and acceptance of the resolution of the council uh, appointing, excuse me, approving the amending the resolution of the redevelopment commission of the declaratory resolution. You see the title there. Um, so also um, under redevelopment commission, we can take that one piece of business or, or keep moving. I know you guys have just had the resolution in front of you um, uh, very briefly. Um, it's in the middle of that green field remark. Yeah, that uh, Uh, it will be tonight. I would hope we could hold that for a little bit. We're going to need to establish a number and everything. Exactly. I was just going to say, because I, I just got this tonight, and I believe because of a prior request from Terry, I believe I already have a resolution number that I had on hold, but if you can give me two seconds to check that, I will. <clears throat> while we're uh, while we're waiting, one other uh, Fedco note. Tell a little bit about the uh, conference call with uh, Frank Boley and uh, Toby Buck mm -hmm. and myself uh, last Thursday. I think that's the uh, Boley is our fellow over in Illinois. Who's, we've been working with uh, for several months now on a plan to move uh, here to Rochester from Peor East Peoria and uh, the program's moving along. He's stepping right up. He has now put a business plan together that he's shared with his customers and his vendors, <coughs> primary customer being Caterpillar, stating in it that he's making a move to Rochester and really <coughs> pointing out all the reasons why and uh, also uh, felt that uh, that was a good place to be to service uh, his big, biggest customer in Lafayette, <coughs> Caterpillar, mm -hmm. uh, the orthopedic industry, Paragon Medical, and also some uh, interest in South Bend and Indianapolis makes a good location for him here. So that's moving along, and Mr. Buck was uh, still very encouraging, but he wanted to be very blunt. He said, don't... Uh, anticipate a move here for you to be solely kept in business by the orthopedic business. You're going to have to have more than that, which he, he realized and was thoroughly aware of that and his planning as such. So it was a good conversation. Uh, Buck's still going to help him become tier two in the orthopedics world which is not a walk in the park. That takes quite a bit to do so he's going to help him with that. So that's, that's where we are, and it was a good conversation, and there's more to come. He said he'd be back in touch, because we're keeping close contact with him. Uh, since the last time we met, Terry's <coughs> also had some communications with uh, Brad Cashaw, the vice president of the deans, that we went to see one of the gentlemen. I've had a phone conversation with uh, uh, Ralph Skazafava, the president, and we're just continuing to keep that line of communication open. Uh, we're trying to get Mr. Cashaw to visit. He wanted to come to Rochester and visit the facility <coughs> firsthand. He, he had, has been with Dean's for about six months. So we're, we're, like I said, just keeping the lines of communication open there. Okay. There are six months, it's time for him to get out of the office, right? That's right. Time for him to make a road trip. There you go. Shada, you got... <coughs> yes, it would be Resolution 2-2017. Or 02-, if you want to write it properly. Okay. You have the floor, Terry. Uh, yeah, so I guess a, a reading a, and a vote on the resolution that we can amend the TIF district. Anything else? 
uh, uh, also I would report that the uh, for safe routes to school um, I have also in your packet some basically some photographs of the we had a um, walk to school days back in November we had uh, six weeks that we did that we had 15 to 20 kids each time uh, the grant that we have from NDOT allowed us to provide some incentives and so forth to the kids um, some safety items some flashing lights and stuff like that when they're walking to school or biking to school uh, one of the things we also want to get to is some infrastructure down um, as a second phase of the project so you can look at basically our route for walking the kids getting the kids together to uh, to get to school this is the west side of fulton avenue between the uh, northwest corner of the library and fourth street and the fourth street goes into the north side of um, riddle school um, so a lot of the approaches at the intersections are uh, not uh, are broken up uh, not ada accessible uh, there's a lot of different damages along the sidewalks in those areas. Fourth Street and Fulton Avenue. Um, you know, there's there, there's there's some kids coming up Fourth Street that are crossing Fulton Avenue. Uh, there's not a four-way stop there, so they're having to cross traffic. There aren't any crosswalks marked in any of these areas. So for your future community investment plan, um, a, a look at um, that west side of Fulton Avenue specifically and Fourth Street turning into a Riddle would be something that we would propose that you uh, give a look at um, for future investment. Um, also, we're getting ready to start the second round of the walk to school. The volunteers right now are hosting that for kids um, every Tuesday morning starting next week until I think the end of school. So I think it's eight weeks this time around. Uh, and that's uh, the wellness coordinator, Betsy Hines from Purdue uh, Extension, a couple of the teachers um, from either the elementary or middle school, um, Andy Schatz and the other police officers have been there which has been great um, uh, we, we would like to uh, we're going to continue to do that we would love to have volunteers in the community whether it's city council or uh, parents um, that would help us establish maybe a second day during the week that we could hold an event like that to to, to just increase awareness of uh, the benefits uh, of walking and biking to school and how to do it safely and so forth so we're going to uh, launch a, another program next week. We're going to have the elementary school kids from Riddle meet at the northwest corner of the library at 7:15. We'll get them in the school before 8 o'clock, and then you're, you know, by 7:45, and you're back to business by 8 o'clock. So, if anyone would like to join us next Tuesday, that'd be great. <coughs> um, and then also, the middle school is starting the program where basically we're going to educate um, and incentivize <coughs> kids increase awareness through again through the grant funds um, with everything for, from some um, helmets and stickers and pencils and those kind of things to uh, what are the sticks with the sugar um, pixie sticks I think they're called you know the kids really like those I think at the middle school so you get them walking to school and then dosing on sugar that'd be a great combination <laughs> wonderful combination oh, that'd be appreciated. and we're also looking at a, at a bike rodeo event possibly um, just after school's out for those members of youth that are in Kiwanis I did a little research and those uh, bike rodeos were actually started up by the Kiwanis group some decades ago um, to increase uh, safety on bikes and stuff like that for kids so maybe there's a partnership there I don't know um, Thank you. And I were in the first bike rodeo, weren't we? Very possible. <laughs> <laughs> I remember you rode big, tall wheels. Yeah. <laughs> um, also, in your packet, there's some just some information on some signage, some temporary signs or permanent signs are allowed in the grant that we have from NDOT. So I'll probably be talking with uh, Lenny, um, maybe you guys again, just to. Uh, uh, move forward with the purchase of some signs that we could use to help increase safety and uh, visibility along at least the, the elementary school route uh, right away we can't build sidewalks and that kind of thing with the grant funds but we can provide some signage so we work with the street department to make sure we get that um, in place where appropriate as soon as we can it has to really relate to the, the safe route to school um, okay. project so if it's around the middle which is elementary and middle not high school but elementary and middle school so okay. uh, we haven't done anything really at uh, Columbia because K through 2 um, biking and, and walking to school we don't I, I think have very much of that we do have some um, but we're, we're starting at Riddle because again we've got 20 kids um, you know, that are turning out for um, just a fun way to get to school. So.
that's all I have unless you guys have questions. Or Anything? Anything? <coughs> Thank you, Terry. Yes. Uh, Councilman Heidi, the Park <coughs> Board. All right. Lenny covered part of his portion of this. You're welcome. Thanks. <laughs> um, Dave Clark came in and asked permission to use the T-Ball Diamond again this year. Um, that was granted. He said they currently have 260, 262 youth signed up and 80 of which are T-Ball. Sarah Reese from Riddle PTO requested uh, 10 day passes for the pool um, for <coughs> incentives to for a fundraiser. For a fundraiser that they're doing. Um, I can't remember, was that table? Or were those no, they did. Those are approved? Okay. Um, so we approved that. Uh, Lenny mentioned the disc golf, and they have the uh, baskets in. Kyle Copeland has been a huge asset on this, and he's really been pushing to do it. Um, the first program this year will be, again, um, run by Donna Freisinger and Laura Manns. And um, Kyle brought up that if they wanted to do something with the new disc golf. Um, there's a lot of disc golf organizations who will give out free discs to youth. <coughs> so they thought he could probably get about 100 discs donated to the parks program so they could utilize um, the new baskets this summer, so that'd be nice. And if there aren't any questions, that is it for the parks. Okay, should probably uh, let you know those day passes. Uh, we can't do that with tax money. So we, we approved those passes, but we passed the hat. The mayor and the city clerk and a couple of ladies in the office who said, yeah, we'll kick in for that. We raised the money for it. Thank you, yes. Yeah, you're quite welcome. It's a good idea, but we can't use tax funds for that. Okay. Thank you, Councilman. Any questions uh, for the Councilman? Okay. Good job on passing the hat. Yeah. I didn't know that. Well, but it didn't go around once. You know, it didn't hit the mayor twice. You know? <laughs> and he guilted my deputy into helping too. So you yeah. Know. Oh, did it? Yeah, she needed to. She's, okay. she's a swimmer. <laughs> okay, the uh, Rochester BZA and Council on Aging, Councilman Smith. BZA met last month. Uh, had two items on the agenda. One was tabled till next month. The other one was a request for 48 feet of additional, 48 square feet, I'm sorry, of additional signing space at 109 East 9th Street. That's the uh, little brick building beside the, where Pizza King is on the corner of 9th and Main. Oh, yes. Yeah. <clears throat> And uh, that was approved 3-0. Uh, the bigger news probably for BZA is that uh, Greg Brown resigned uh, effective immediately. And I believe maybe that's the mayor's position to appoint. So I know that you're looking at that. A couple of people considering it, yeah. So that was it for the BZA. Council on AG met yesterday. Um, and King from RSVP was not there, so there's not an RSV report. From Fulton County Transpo, the big <clears throat> news is the anticipation of rides going down uh, is not happening at all. And as of the end of February, Transpo is averaging 224 trips a day. They did 4,284 trips in February alone and are well on pace for doing more than 50,000 trips uh, this year. From Council on Aging, the big news was that uh, we did apply for a, a community grant, the Indiana Community Foundation, and uh, we were fortunate to receive 17,000 $500 from the foundation, which is a matching grant, which is going to go to buying two uh, replacement vehicles in 2017. Um, the golf outing 
uh, for those that would be interested. We're going to move it back in the year just a little bit. The weather's been horrendous for that event for the last couple of years, so it is now set for June 10. <clears throat> the fire inspection has been done in the building. There was $600 of a fix that needed to be made, which has been done. You've probably seen in the paper that for the first time and I don't know how long, but almost forever, the, there's a change in the rate for rides that's effective May 1st. I reported last month that there was a LeSabre that was for sale that was parked out front of the council <coughs> aging. It did sell and uh, $1,000, which was a good deal for the council, but it was a good deal for the young lady that bought it. The only bad news was she's now no longer needing a ride from Council Agents. <laughs> she's giving rides herself. Yeah, right. right. <laughs> the, um, the board also, everybody received a copy of the bylaws. Uh, we are in the process of uh, rewriting those just a little bit and also making sure that our procedures are following the bylaws that are in place. And the last thing I will mention just to the council to uh, think about, it is becoming harder and harder for the Council on Aging to run. The, the funds are dwindling, and two years ago, United Way support was $10,000. It has it's since been cut to $4,200, and yet trans, between Transpo and the services that are provided at the council, uh, continues to be a busier place than ever so something that we might be considering at next budget cycle is uh, maybe a little more support from the city on the upping upping that line item mm -hmm. so um, that's it pending any questions the, uh, the fire inspection deficiencies which building was that in? That was in the, the old main building. Building. Yes. And all it was was they tried to keep, there's, there's a couple of sets of big heavy doors. And when they're closed, which the fire inspectors say they need to be closed in the event of a fire, but the reality is the people that use the building, they're in using walkers or canes or wheelchairs and they simply can't open the doors. The bathroom doors are hard enough to, so the fix was a magnetic uh, latch that's on the wall. The door is kept open. The magnetic latch is attached electronically to the fire alarm system, so if an alarm would go off, the magnetic latch releases and the door closes but it allows them freer access in the building, the people that are using it. So. The reason I ask, not a lot of people know this, and it gets a little confusing sometimes, I think ex-commissioner Rose can back me up on this, the city has primary responsibility for the main building. We own the main building, but the garage, new garage, was the county. Uh, I think we ran into that with insurance coverage, right. I found that out. Because the county was the... Uh, uh, the main uh, <coughs> title holder, main, main name sponsor on the grant uh, to build that garage. Right. Okay. Make sure Lois sets another one to put down in the fire. Well, I shot an honor with you that. Yeah, right? yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. I, have, I have a question, Mark. Who's in charge of snow removal of the sidewalks over there? The city. The city is in charge of snow removal. Yeah, we do that. Okay. The lawn maintenance and snow <coughs> removal is all city. All city. Mm -hmm. It's all city. And we call on that and question on it. That's, that's going to be interesting. So we own the property, but the garage is owned by the county. Yeah, but we do, we do that. Okay. Um, Chase is not here this evening for his report on the solid waste of the animal adoption center. There were reports in the council packets that okay. we provided, okay. so mm -hmm. if you had a chance to review them. Okay. Um, 
Stacy, would you like to stand up and tell about the last meeting and mention what Chase was going to go through, or do you know we have all that? I don't have all that with me. Okay. Okay. Uh, tree board uh, and BMS, Councilman Fitzwater. Tree board met on the 16th of March. The main topic was the the new the new list of trees that need to be addressed, either looked at, limbed up, or taken down. Uh, Ray Dosman and uh, Eric Schlarf were going to look at those and bring back the the ones they said yes to had to come down or the ones that could wait or not could be coming down. The, the main topic. Um, at that time, it was still too early to see if the main, the new trees on Main Street to see if they, how they had done. But you know, two weeks since then, now it might be, you know, it might be budding out or I think so. Showing some signs of life. Hopefully they all will. Mm -hmm. uh, and I need to train Lenny Conley to give reports. He did, he, he is now coming to our meetings and tying in. <laughs> well, the second time you were there, he was he was there for me. Yeah. But like with Derek Holloway, basically gives Councilman Garrett's report. I need to train Mr. Conley to do that with my reports. <laughs> I know, I know. You're pushing your luck. Well, I'm trying to work on it. <laughs> I don't know where you're going with that, Brian? <laughs> uh, but that was basically it. Uh, we had, we met on the 16th because of. Pistolon's vacation for the normal first meeting, and we'll meet again next Thursday for the uh, tree board. And hopefully, we'll have, well, at that point, we'll have a better understanding as to what needs to come down. Then we'll have to rebid that again. But uh, Lenny, since you brought Lenny up there, he was there asking for some relief on the uh, tree lawn area where the ninth and Main Street Park right. will be located. We'll uh, have the nice park and then. Have some trees thrown up where they're not going to complement the park. Yeah, no, that, that wasn't. As far as I know, that wasn't any part of what the tree board is going to do. We're looking okay. at taking down the, the ones that have to come down and replacing those uh, if, if they need to be replaced. Uh, the EMS board did not meet this past month. Uh, it is scheduled to meet on the the 14th of April, but we found out that that's Good Friday. And so we're going to try to move it to the following Friday. But if there's proper notices and all that. Uh, has Reverend May approached you, the tree board from uh, the Lutheran Church, relative to the big tree out in front of their church? Do you know offhand? I don't know. There's so many. Sometimes they come in with just the addresses, so I don't know. Do you know where that is, roughly? It's right over here behind us. Um, at the, you know, the Lutheran. Lutheran Church. Yeah, yeah. Just if you would chat with the, the board at your next is meeting. It, was it Reverend Casey, do you know of any action <coughs> there? Has he been to you? I haven't heard anything since we got out there to look at it. About the parking? Okay. Is it I'm talking about that Reverend May or May? <coughs> Reverend May. Okay. May Y. All right. I will pass that on. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> any questions for Councilman Fitzwater? <clears throat> Councilman Garrett, the water board. I can't believe it. I'm going to get to talk a little bit again. I can't. Like, oh, yeah, once every once in a while, <laughs> Eric's not here to cover all the bases. He's pretty thorough, isn't he? Yes, he is. Does a nice job. I always compliment him. And uh, we met on March the 6th. Uh, of course, we went over the length of this for, uh, for the month of March, and it was approved update by Derek was that everything is just running fine, which is what we want to hear. I also did a drive-by the other day, and that's one thing I wanted to talk to Derek about, as to the company, the electric company that has been in behind the water plant, and Derek had mentioned, I do believe at our last meeting, and that's why I went over the other day, that they tore up the grounds a little bit, and I thought, well, I'm going to go take a look and see. Interesting. One person's yeah. opinions of it being torn up, and another person's opinion, it's torn up. Yeah. Brother, it's torn up. Yeah. And we have to stay on them to make sure that I do know that other utility companies, when they tear up the ground, they bring dirt in, they seed it, and we have to stay on them to get them to do that for us because that is not our responsibility and our people and our money should not have to go for 
<coughs> topsoil and grass seed. Update was presented to Derek uh, <coughs> to the board on Peerless Midwest. They completed their uh, yearly maintenance on wells three, four, five, all high service pumps and the backwash pumps wells one and two will be completed later in the spring when the power line company is complete with their project. And that's what we're talking about. Uh, the Fulton County uh, Youth Leadership <coughs> Academy was at our last meeting. Yeah, it's uh, high school students that are required to attend two uh, meetings a year and they chose the Rochester Water Board meeting. They didn't have a lot to say or comment on, but they were at our meeting and got their feet wet. <laughs> yeah, yeah. They were very nice and very attentive. They had a couple of good, pretty good questions, honestly. Uh, and then the, the board reviews the letter for the new billing cycle. They asked for the letter to be sent out right away, which is a great idea to uh, business, the businesses and regular customers and after any changes have been made. And they're going to get on that and get them sent out just as soon as possible. Are they? Done, did, 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 great, great the business are going out this week. They're going this way? Yes. I didn't have mine on my last one, but that's yeah. great. Update was presented to the board on the employee segregations, and none of them were. And um, Marvin, there was no further business to be done, but they did make a new one inch tap for the animal shelter. And other than that, uh, the meeting was closed at 5 30. Any other questions? It was a fast meeting. Normally they last a little longer than that, but any other questions for anybody? No, that's pretty complete. Nice job. I don't get to do that very well. <laughs> I know, I need to get on I need to get on TV. Any, uh, anything for John? Rochester Downtown Partnership, Sarah Reese. Good evening. I'm going to try to talk a little fast because I kind of have a lot that we have going on right now, which is good. But uh, we have opened our next round of facade grant applications. Those applications will be accepted until May 1st. And we have two different, as we did last year, we have two different options for um, either business or building owners that they can apply for. One is primarily for signs and awnings. They are one-to-one -one matching grants for up to $1,000. And then we also have uh, facade grants that are more for like windows and brickwork, that kind of thing. <coughs> those are one to three matching grants for up to $5,000. Uh, as I said, those applications are due by May 1st. Winners will be notified by June 1st and we ask the work to be completed by October 31st. So those are quick turnaround grants that hopefully we'll be able to see some additional improvements to our downtown. We have about $18,000 to award this year, uh, thanks to the Redevelopment Commission. So we are anxious to see which applications come in. We did have two informational workshops uh, last week at the library with Indiana Landmarks to help those property owners kind of understand how to maintain the historic appeal of their buildings and but still be feasible and the two gentlemen that we work with from indiana landmarks are also willing to work with those applicants if they have proposed design that is not in line with the historical aspect of what we're wanting to see to kind of help them to make it that way and to see what their options are in terms of maintaining the historic integrity of their buildings so it's not just going to be a nope this doesn't qualify if it doesn't adhere to those guidelines they're going to work with those applicants on how to um, adhere and how to make their buildings historically relevant so uh, another big kind of big announcement that we had that we made on my radio show last week uh, we have partnered with Split Road Media and our Economic Vitality team, which is uh, headed up by Mason, and we are going to be offering to five property owners, kind of as a trial run, some virtual tours of their properties. Those businesses or those property owners that are looking to either rent or sell their properties. Our focus is on that main main level commercial property. Uh, we are also our kind of preferences for those who are actively looking to fill those spaces. Um, at no cost to the owner, we'll do these virtual tours. And like I said, it'll be for five properties as a trial run. Um, when those virtual tours are done, those five properties will have a sign board in their window, window that'll have a QR code on it. 
And that QR code will then link to our website where that virtual tour will be. But it's not just going to be specific to that one property. So when they follow that QR code with their smartphone, it'll link back to all the properties we have available. Um, Mason has gotten from Casey's office kind of a building inventory of what we have, and we're going to be working on getting specs from those building owners and knowing, you know, is this a property that's move-in ready? A business could walk in, move their stuff in, and turn the, turn the lights on tomorrow, or is this a property that's going to need more work to be able to move into it? So when they link back to that website, it's going to have all the properties that are available in our area. It won't just be those five that we have virtual tours for. It'll have all the specs that we have about the buildings, space, like I said, condition of the property. Um, and then if the property is for sale, it will have all the information for the listing agent. So this is something that we're hoping is going to be um, kind of a, a help to the realtors that this is we're not in the business of trying to sell property um, this is something that they can utilize if they are trying to sell a business or a building downtown that they would be able to say hey click on this link and you can see a virtual tour of the property it might actually make it easier for them to sell the property because uh, outside investors would be able to have kind of that bird's eye view of what the property looks like yeah okay. and yes while this program might help a building owner that's not the focus of the program the, fo the focus is to help a business that's looking to looking for a new location mm -hmm. to see what's available you know while yes it is added benefit to the building owner this is a tool for someone looking to relocate right. or open up mm -hmm. shop downtown absolutely and that that is our goal um what Mason's committee is really looking to do once we have that building inventory more fine-tuned is to really look at that leakage report that was provided in the revitalization plan and try to seek out some businesses and say, you know, if we know we're leaking in this one area and they can find a business in the Kokomo area that's been really successful and talk to them about potentially opening a second location in Rochester. And then as Mason said, this would be a tool that they could easily see the properties that are available for them to move those businesses into. So we're really looking at offering something that gives those people looking for a place to put their business a, a comprehensive look at what's available and really help them to say, yeah, this is where I want to be. <clears throat> In the sense of what? As far as advertising the properties and putting it on the MLS, putting it in, on the internet, and making it available. To no, this will this will just link to. Well, you can't put it on the MLS. I know. Yeah. No. But we and, already have it on the, and I say we because obviously it's right. a yeah. So we already have it in, in, you know, on the internet and doing the advertising as the listing broker. Mm -hmm. So you're going to be like, if I have a listing downtown, you're going to want to my listing no we, we wouldn't if if there's a building that's listed with a broker we're, we're not we're not here to compete right no, no, no. no. exactly but okay so uh, so what i'm saying is that you said that if someone you get in touch with the listing broker we would have that contact and for you know if a property owner contacts us and says yes i'm interested in having you do this for my property this virtual tour and they are trying to sell the property if they have it listed with an agent we're going to put that contact information in with where we have all the specs on our on our website so that if someone's looking to purchase a property and it is a property for sale then they know who to contact it's quite honestly they, they should already they should <laughs> right and it and it may be that this is going to be more uh, appealing to those property owners who are looking to rent their facilities that aren't wanting to sell the property but are just wanting to fill a vacant space um, this is something that's done quite frequently in larger cities um, to have these virtual tours that kind of allows people to be able to see the property before they would contact someone to actually do a physical walkthrough very interesting. <laughs> There'll be eyes on you. Yeah, absolutely. That's that's the goal. We want we want eyes on downtown Rochester. I know, right? <laughs> I know, right? And that's you know, and that is one thing that we've said all along is 
this is we don't want to compete you know as you said we can't compete i mean this is that's not our intention we just recognize there's a lot of vacant properties in downtown rochester that have potential and we want people to be able to see what's there if if they are looking to relocate business or add add a second location to their business right absolutely Um, kind of piggybacking on that a little bit um, Amy and Mason and I and Stephen Ray who is our contact with the North Central Indiana Regional Planning Council Commission Council Council. Council. I never remember what the C stands for. Um, met with a gentleman from IU Kokomo. His name is Alan Krabenhoft. He um, is a professor for one of their graduate program courses. And every semester, their grad students that are in this course have to complete a project with a business or a nonprofit organization as part of the course requirement. It is fortunately free to us, which is always an appeal when you are on a very fixed budget. Um, but he, we kind of pitched the idea to him that we would like to work with those graduate students to kind of fine tune that building inventory in the sense of, you know, we have the information from Casey's office, but working with property owners to say, okay, what are, what are the more detailed specs of that building? What are you trying to fill it with? What are you wanting to put in there? And then also fine tuning that leakage report that was in the revitalization plan to say, okay, sporting goods, that's a big category to say we're losing money in what specifically are we looking at where could we really benefit in terms of dollars and being able to pursue some businesses based on that information um, we're very early in the planning stages of that and one of the reassurances that alan gave us is that if he doesn't have students that he feel could successfully complete the project he's not going to do it he's not going to take it on and give us students that he doesn't think are going to be able to effectively complete what we want done um, so we would be looking at their summer semester students in that enrolled in that program for their summer semester and um, kind of over the next month or so we should have more details of how all that's going to play out um, our promotions team is gearing up for our events that we have that kind of take place in the spring and summer the color run has been set for may 13th and they are meeting tomorrow to kind of finalize those details so that we can go to uh, through the proper channels to make sure that we have roads uh, blocked off as needed and all of that good stuff um, then we are also looking at as <coughs> terry alluded to our block party on june 24th which is why we are hopeful that the Centennial Park will be completed by then so we can utilize that for part of that block party event. Um, we are anticipating having kind of a different feel to that block party this year and doing more of a taste of Rochester type of event. Chrissy Rossworm is our is my lead on that committee so she's kind of working through all the details of that. And then the last thing I have is that um, we have about 1300 postcard mailer not postcard but flat mailers that will be sent to the mail routes that service the lake this week um, and those are offering an opportunity to partner with the downtown partnership financially um, the the reason we chose the lake as kind of our initial target area was twofold one of the reasons is that the businesses in rochester have said you know we support through chamber membership and different things and we don't want to be asked a million times for money so we didn't want that to be where we went initially and then also uh, the lake population is one that has repeatedly come to the chamber office specifically and said how can we make downtown more appealing how can we you know tell us more about this downtown partnership when they come to the lake they want to have additional things to do and places to go so they have a vested interest in seeing the downtown thrive so that's why kind of why we started there but those will go out this week questions that's I all I have question sure uh, and maybe Terry uh, <coughs> ask Terry to help with this mm -hmm. how are our two Oprah grant recipients doing on uh, upgrading their uh, properties I know that Harry is basically waiting for the weather <laughs> Um, he has been working with his architect and getting all of those plans finalized for the the webs building um, the and other too, he's waiting for a, a re to, right to start anything inside so he's waiting mm -hmm. for weather for a re 
yeah, and I kind of figured that's where he was as well. So they're both kind of just waiting for that. You know, it's Indiana, and while the weather has been nice, we all know it, it's not over yeah, yet. Everything on the grants has been approved, and they're mm -hmm. just basically waiting for Harry and Ken to submit, you know, right. <clears throat> requests for the money. Mm -hmm. And they're just waiting for the weather so that they can move forward on those things. I see Dr. Hawks moving right along with the Manitou Manor Apartments. Mm -hmm. Got them pretty well gutted, I think. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Anything else, Sarah? Thank you. Sarah. Thank you. Okay, that takes us to uh, unfinished business, our uh, curbside recycling. Taking around for a while. Uh, I assume we've got a lot of people who like curbside recycling in the audience tonight. And I don't, I don't not like curbside recycling. I don't know what I say, but we spent the last few weeks with the help of uh, Commissioner Lewis, Shada, digging into records. And this is one thing that's kind of interesting about government. You get people who come and go, and those people who uh, are in their seats today don't necessarily know what transpired years ago. Is that a fair statement, Commissioner Lewis? Very much. <laughs> so we've been doing some record checking, and uh, got some bullet points here. Council. I've, got a, I've got a typo. The district, the Solid Waste District, was formed in 1992. <coughs> that it was uh, edict by the state to the different counties to set up solid waste districts. You could do it in one of two fashions. You could fund it through taxes, putting a tax levy on your, your county residents, or if you were lucky enough to have something like our landfill, you could do it through host fees. Correct me if I say anything wrong here, Commissioner Rose, because you were around in those days, right? Uh, <clears throat> as far as the, you know, you had the uh, landfill option from a host fee, but I believe the other option was it was a per household fee, because that's the way we did, we did it originally. Uh, it wasn't done with a uh, uh, tax load. No, no, it's one of the options, though, through the state code. Okay, well, to yeah, go yeah, through yeah, tax yeah, that's, that's not how we, we did it originally. It was with... Uh, Per household fee. Well, well several, several of the counties chose to uh, impose it as part of the county taxes. That was an option. I didn't realize that. We did go to a households and impose a fee. That's another option. That's there another were, there option. Was three okay. 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 So per household fee. But at that time, is that is that a tax? We called it a household fee, so, so I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. They're taking our money, it's a tax. <laughs> <laughs> My bad, Gary. What's used to be? Where's, where's our pictures? Where's the rest of you? Come get me. Okay, so the fee would have been different from a tax situation. No? I don't know. You're getting into the semantics okay. there. Just, that's well, what we call it. It makes a big difference as to how your solid waste district is set up because if it's a tax supported entity, then it's like the animal shelter or the uh, uh, senior says center or whatever, and they go through a whole different structure of auditing. Right, Marianne? You've got an old auditor in the family. Yeah. Um, but anyway, we chose the host fee option to support that entity. Uh, with that being said, um, and those are also called tipping fees, and they were quite lucrative when we started out with the landfill situation. I mean, to a point where months, some months, millions of dollars were coming in for dispersal. Uh, there was an ordinance set up uh, by the county Ordinance 031699, which defined how those tipping fees would be utilized. And uh, shares were set up by that ordinance to be dispersed by the county to the county, the city, three area towns, the eight townships, and the Fulton <coughs> County Community Foundation of the Northern Indiana Community Foundation for deposit into a non-reverting host fee fund for general county purposes, including but not limited to environmental education, 
the preservation activities as determined by the Fulton County Council. This would be the fund used to pass out the grants, the large grants that were passed out over the years. Uh, in the distribution process, after the uh, uh, solid waste district received on a monthly basis $33,333.33. that figure ring a bell, Stacy? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's your regular disbursement you would have received. Then, after just about approximately $66,000 going into the host fee fund, what was left was divided by the county. The county received a 30% distribution. The city received a 20% distribution. And the other entities received a proportionate distribution as, as you went down the list. So everybody shared in the, in the wealth. In 2007, 2007, due to a reduction in the host fees, when we first started to see the reduction in the host fees, the county chose to stop giving out shares to the city, the three area towns, and the eight townships. And there's a letter on file, the reason given for those monies would now be used to make bond payments for the courthouse renovations and new annex, because that was one of the main reasons the tipping fees were brought in for the county use. That was one of their ma the main reasons. Mayor Thompson objected at that time and wrote a letter, which is on file, uh, wanting to have a meeting of all the stakeholders the city, the county, and the uh, other city, towns and townships, the county decided not to have that meeting. Mayor Thompson asked to be put on the agenda for the county council's next meeting. We have no idea what transpired in that meeting. We have yet to come the, across the minutes. The records are ready. We just haven't. We haven't. They we got haven't ready gotten, today. We picked them up. Today. We have more research to do. Uh, at no time should citizens' tax monies have been used to fund our curbside program, which we inadvertently started to do in 2015 by bringing the city into that. Uh, the statement in the paper is not true. There has been tax <coughs> monies used to help support that program by virtue of the street department employees and the city assets being used for the curbside. Uh, we need uh, to continue to do our investigating. Uh, we, we decided at the city level, I'm talking with Lenny and such, that we're going to continue the curbside for at least another month as it is. But we're requesting a meeting with the county to review the host fee status as things stand today. There have been a lot of changes since 2007, one of them being the courthouse and annex bonds have been paid off. <clears throat> so that is no longer an expense for the, uh, the host fee process. So we are requesting, and now I'll do that by virtue of going to a county council meeting, that we sit down and look at this again. There should be $2,300 a month, in my opinion, somewhere in these host fees, even though they've been reduced, to support a curbside program. That's our current position on things. But the bottom line is, we still have some more homework to do. And I appreciate Commissioner Lewis' time that he spent on this. Clark Beeler, I appreciate her time. There's been some real man hours put into this because all this stuff is in boxes stored away. So that's where we are with it today. We're going to continue, at least for another month, so we have all the answers sorted out. And like I said, we're gonna to try to find some money through the host fee program. Sound like a plan, Commissioner Lewis? So, yeah, so. Okay. We at least need an update <coughs> as to what the situation is today. I I would say uh, it's obvious that there's a lot of public interest uh, in this topic by virtue of our audience tonight, which is great. And I actually uh, yeah, was, was contacted, contacted by two people, uh, interestingly, interestingly not, not in my district, but 
who I know well, and they were passionate about the city trying to keep this project going and keeping it local. Well, that's the message I got. Like so. I said, I, this mayor is not opposed to the recycling program, but I, I'm also a businessman and a realist when it comes to handling the city assets. And first of all, we have a program where we're servicing 24% uh, of the households in Rochester with 100% of the residents' tax monies. That's not a good situation. And uh, if, if we, <coughs> down the road, there's not a host fee answer to this and this council decides to make it a line item situation, like the animal shelter, or like the uh, senior citizens, uh, we can certainly approach it in that manner, but again, that brings us into a whole different level of accountability. When you say 24%, where are the other people that are not being served by the recycling? They're not recycling. They're just not doing it. Right. Or they go to the, oh, they go to the, I'm one that doesn't do curbside recycling, but I recycle. I okay. take my stuff to the center, and we do it at the <coughs> office so as just well. Curbside, so. just yeah, I, I should say they're not putting anything out on the curb, uh, and that that has been a question too, Gretchen. Uh, when we first started down this this road, the city started down this road. Five days is what it twice a month is what it took to complete this 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 curbside recycling. When the private entities were doing it, it was, uh, uh, instead of 10 days a month, it was 20 days a month. And yeah, lots of people are saying, well, at one time, it seemed like it would have been twice the many as many people. We're not seeing that. And nor did we see a difference in, in the P&L sheets that we took a look at going back five years as far as the income in the uh, resale of the recyclables. You'd think if there were twice as many people, your recyclables would be twice as, dollar value would be twice as high. We're not seeing that. So are these people, were they recycling and now they're not? Are they taking it out to the, we don't know. We don't know exactly what they're doing, but we know how many households we're going to. We, we counted. Uh, and again, we're not we're not doing 20 days. We're doing 10 a month. They never did 20 days. Oh boy, I've got the invoices here. If you'd like to but, see them, they right. got them by to, day. That's the way they do the invoices. You have to divide that by two. If you look at it, Stacy, they, they, they got May 28th, May 29th, May 30th, and what? How many households they picked up? They got it by date right. on the invoices. Right. Now, this is before you. This was before your management uh, toolage out there. This was a fast uh, practice. So, you know, is that is that not a correct figure? If you're, if you say you, you serviced 198 homes on May the 28th, that doesn't mean you serviced 198 homes? That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying they didn't do it 20 days a month. They've, they've always only done it a week on, a week off. Some of that was probably Akron, Kiwana, and Fulton. I don't know. I'd have to look and see what you're talking about. But, because they did Akron, Kiwana, and Fulton on the weeks that they didn't do Rochester. Okay, well there's a there's a big difference in the numbers that, that it's about half. We've got, we're servicing about half as many as those numbers that were reported in years past. And again, like I said, going back to the and L statements take 2015 the first time we did it and the numbers were down the dollar value for the recyclable inventory that we brought to you wasn't half as much as what it was before it was very close to the same figure so I don't know there's some inaccuracies or something but at any rate uh, that number is 24 percent of the 2400 households in Rochester that poses a lot of, uh, David? Well, in your research, I think the one thing you should look at in your research is, we've had a recycling center here for a long time. We started curbside recycling years after. My question would be, how many more households recycled with curbside than when they hold their out there themselves? And 
I remember talking to Mike question. what happened. And within a year, there's only like a half a dozen more people reside than because of curbside. Yeah. And a half a dozen people, to me, doesn't warrant driving city trucks around for two weeks. I mean, most people who recycled before and pulled it out there themselves didn't make a special trip. They did it on their route through town doing other things. I'm not against curbside recycling. I, we curbside recycle and we take it out there both. But if we're only increasing by a few percent of people that are going curbside because we come by and pick it up, and everybody else would already take it out there, to me, it sounds like we're doing a lot of work for not the 24%, but the 2%. Yeah, and, and we don't know. We, yeah, we don't know yeah. that, but that's something we don't really know. they can probably tell you there how many people brought stuff before and how many brought after. So okay. if you knew that research, it'd be great information to have. Well, at any rate, this is what we've come up with. That we, we do need to sit down <coughs> with our, our brothers at the county and I think get a, get a today update on where the host fee situation is and where those monies are going. Uh, I found in here that in, in Commissioner Rose, you can uh, speak to this, but about 2009, we established a non-reverting fund for the 31 corridor project. Right. And there are host fees going into that. And I assume that's for any miscellaneous costs you incur when the state puts the, uh, the corridor in and the county has some miscellaneous costs to deal with it. It'll be from that fund just trying to anticipate uh, uh, what some of those costs, we're gonna have some costs and have some uh, uh, fun to deal with. And so uh, our participation in 31 coalitions paid for that. Where are we with Clinton County? Are they anticipating taking this over? Or? They're, they're on hold. They can, they can react. With them? They can react pretty quickly. What's involved there is we pull the current bins off and <clears throat> give to you and modify our trailer and then they have roll offs that just come in and lock onto the trailer. Unlock and they roll off. That's what I'm looking Yeah, no, they're, I think they're, there's a better answer. They're not, uh, they're not waiting at uh, 9th Street to charge in. They're, they're on hold for this. So, Commissioner uh, Lewis, we got some work to do. Uh, you've, got, you've seen me at the next council meeting. I have yes. a question. Um, you mentioned the meeting with the county officials. <clears throat> Would you also include the solid waste district? Uh, anybody can. I'm going to go to the. I'm going to get on the agenda for the county council meeting. And, and I mean, they're gonna know what it's about. This is on TV. I'm gonna provide the same information. Uh, Commissioner Lewis has the same information I have. Uh, they'll, they'll know what we're looking for. We should uh, should be able to have a dialogue at the next uh, council meeting. You know the date of that meeting? <coughs> you know offhand, uh, Brian? Third, I've got, it's the third Tuesday of the month. Yeah, it was six. The, the 18th. Six. Yeah, the 18th at uh, 6.30, or yeah, 6.30. Or 6 o'clock, there's 6.30. Yeah. Okay. That's where we, we stand today. I guess I, I, would, I would point out to the, to answer your question, I believe that was Caroline and Aspen, I think I recognize the voice. Um, if you want it to be a joint meeting, we had actually done that at our last council meeting. We had scheduled a joint meeting with the Solid Waste District, the county commissioners, county council, and the city council. And uh, it was due to doing some research, it ended up not being a viable meeting. So if you guys do want to schedule a joint meeting like that with all of the entities, it's just a matter of deciding it, setting the date, and then everybody has to do an advertisement that it's a public meeting. Because um, for instance, you've got a majority of your Solid Waste Board here now which could potentially be a violation of the open door law um, if they were all to speak. So if you do want to do that and have an open dialogue, that's all that needs to happen is just to advertise it as a joint meeting with everybody and then all of you guys can all have that conversation. Are they covered by the open door law? Uh, they're still covered by the open door law. Even though they're not a tax supported entity? Uh, that's my understanding, yes. Okay. okay. Well, I do know that at the county council meeting, we normally have three commissioners there, don't we? Any of you want to come, please. 
come to that uh, and find out uh, where we stand today with the host fee situation. <coughs> okay. Um, Gene, you've been sitting a long time. <laughs> Is it the 4th of July yet? Well, it'll be here before we know it. <laughs> We've got the Gene Manners here tonight with uh, the American Legion, and I believe the topic is uh, the 4th of July fireworks. Is that correct? Sure. Sure. Um, I'm the newbie at this, remember? <laughs> You're the newbie at this? Yes. Yeah, yeah I brought her along for support. Well, let me prepare you, because the last one we, we had did half their presentation before they figured out they were on TV. <laughs> <laughs> well, I've never been real shy. Okay. Uh, last year, and you and Amy came to us and at the American Legion Post here in Rochester, Post 36, and asked if we would uh, uh, serve as sponsors for the 4th of July fireworks. And being a patriotic uh, an event that it is, we... Uh, I took it to the meeting, and and you came and spoke, and uh, they elected to take it on. So we're doing it again this year, it appears. And uh, uh, last year, the city was generous enough to uh, support the fireworks with, I believe it was five thousand uh, dollars. I've already spoken to the Lake Manitou Association. And I haven't gotten back a confirmation yet, but they uh, told me that it was in their budget for $2,000. Uh, we're a little bit different this year. I'll just tell you, I, got a, I sent out a message to uh, uh, the uh, fireworks company, RKM, and uh, got a response back from, uh, from them. And... <clears throat> Basically speaking, last year the fireworks ran us about $8,500. And right at, I mean, I guess that was the, the amount. Well, they aren't cheap. They no, are they not. are not. And they're not getting any cheaper. And in his response, he came back and basically says, to maintain a similar show as, as last year will require a show budget of $8,900. A $400 increase on it and he also put in there that if uh, if we could see fit to bump it to 9,000 even of course. <laughs> he likes even numbers yeah, <laughs> that uh, the, they are going to add a, an additional um, 12 three cylinder shots and uh, what is it uh, they give it a they call it a the final yeah. cylinder titanium salute chain so uh, <clears throat> we're not real sure as to what we're going whether it's just going to be to, to upgrade on that but the support the city gives us is definitely going to be important to do this the other thing I wanted to bring up is is last year we did it on the 3rd of July instead of the 4th uh, for one reason is that's a we're directly competing with Akron and that being their birthday and we didn't see any reason to try and draw people from them nor from us so again this year uh, the 4th of July being on a Tuesday we'd like to uh, uh, tentatively I have it tentatively set up to do the 3rd of July again this year with the 4th of July being the rain date, should we get rained out. And unless there's some obje objection to that, then I would contact them and finalize that. So. Yeah, the other part of that that we had spoken, and I think that she had, Monica had spoken, um, was <laughs> to speak to Tom Butler um, on a yes. conference call, wherever he's at, um, regarding uh, putting the potential uh, food truck in that uh, horseshoe area uh, to be able yeah two of them uh, last year uh, we had worked it out with Tom with uh, Chief Butler to potentially give them the opportunity to uh, have a 
fundraiser to raise the extra funds for the fireworks that's not supported by the city and or by um, the Lake Nantal Association. And generally, the other funds come from uh, the other Good service idea. organizations. But we wanted to make sure that was still okay because it is city property, and so we wanted to confirm that that would still be um, acceptable. Chief, how do you feel about that? On the east, of the east end of the building where the bays are, there's a, there's a grass area right next to the building where the driveway circles around. Uh, because they're gonna need uh, electricity and water, I said I could set two up there, but two would be the limit because I have to be within the fire codes 10 feet away from the building and adequate space between the trailers. If I enforce it uptown, I have to enforce it out of the station as well. <laughs> so that would, that, would, that would provide two vendor spaces for them to, to do something. That's okay with you? That fits your... Would you make a note? We need to bring this to the Board of Works. Sure. Yeah, we can do that Thursday. And that would provide the additional potential financing to support whatever they are not able to fundraise. You know, the, the first thing the Board of Works always wants to know is what does the Chief Butler or the Chief Schatz have to say about sure. something that involves those things. Mm -hmm. uh, let uh, Chief Butler bring it to the Board of Works meeting. Perfect. The other thing that we're doing to do, uh, uh, Monica set this up, and I didn't realize that uh, she's uh, been helping me with all this. And uh, I didn't realize, but Dairy Queen has a sponsor uh, night. sponsorship night day evening whatever you want to call it every month and we have three of them scheduled <laughs> one in a April one in uh, May and one in June at this point but we were told that we could do them every month if we wanted to That's a and they portion of their sales they mm -hmm. donate 10 percent of their of their uh, uh, sales from four o'clock till closing which is a great program. I'd like to, I mean, I'm commending them on that. That is a great program. So we are set up to do that. And I'm looking for volunteers, anybody that wants to help. <laughs> but uh, because we do need to be work, there. So you know. Pardon? It's not a lot of work. No, I understand that. But it's, they, they, they requested that somebody from the organization be there during right. that time. Marty and, and I couldn't help out because we eat more ice cream. <laughs> That's just I more money that, that goes in, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I knew getting these guys involved was a thing. To do Amen. Hard workers. Yeah. You could, this yeah. guy is, you know, we can commend this guy. He has taken this project and he has ran with it. He's such a support. He's freed up some of my time to be able to focus on other chamber benefits. And yeah. sure had so, a that would happen. Yep. Good yep. So, well, are we good for the Thank you, house? but it's, it's more than one. Yeah. Believe me. Monica. So d is there additional step for the $5,000 appropriation? Well, we, we have, it's in the charitable contribution line. Yeah, it's, it's already a line item. I just need an invoice. It's, um, okay. But it, it's, it's $5,000. Right. Yeah. We can't up it yet. It's oh, the budget's yeah. already established. Yep. But that's, we have a charitable contribution line item. That's yeah. Okay. And if there's ever, if there's anything about it going on or anything coming down to the wire that you have any concerns or interest, if you can't reach her, Please feel free to call me. I'll try and answer what I can. <laughs> I guess to me, my question would be is, uh, since, you, since the American Legion is the sponsor, lead on this, uh, rather than the chamber would send me an invoice. But in your case, all I need is just a letter from the organization oh, okay. requesting the financial. Just need it on our letterhead. On mm -hmm. your letterhead. Sure. And Instead of an invoice. And that yeah, out. and that, that's perfectly, we can handle that real easily. And we are, as uh, soon as I can gather up my commander and round him up for a few minutes one of these days, we're going to uh, go to the bank and we're going to set up a, a separate account to make it easy to be accountable for the, for the donations. Because we, I received some donations uh, last year from uh, individuals after the fireworks. I had probably two hundred dollars worth of donations come in after that. And that will happen. Yeah. You know, you're still basically in the glory of fireworks. <laughs> right. Here's a hundred dollars for next year. Yeah. And that's, and we want that to happen, and but I want to be able to be accountable and and keep it all separate. So we're gonna we're just gonna put it in a separate account, and that way, uh, we'll know what's going on with it, and anybody else 
is welcome to know what's going on with it. So, anybody got any questions for Jim or Amy? Thank you very much. Thank you. I appreciate the opportunity to come in and talk to you. Good work, James. Thank you. Okay, Casey. Casey Coles, fee waiver for Centennial Park permit. Hello, I passed around a new packet. Um, I know Shada had given you one. I've received draft plans <clears throat> since then, and then I revised them um, to color code them so that everybody could um, kind of see it a little bit easier, our discussion tonight. <laughs> you know, you have to bear with me. That's not working. Um, anyway, the fee waiver is for Centennial Park. Uh, this would be for 9th and Main. And basically, you have an LLC that is requesting a permit from my office. Right now, it would be a location improvement permit. And um, let's see, right now, it would be a building permit for the sidewalk and um, the electrical and the plumbing that would be going in. I'm trying to think of all the different components. The location improvement permit um, and the sign permit that I have listed on here would be under your zoning ordinance. Um, so the concrete, sidewalk, electrical, plumbing would all be under your building code and that's why they're all listed. Um, so this fee waiver would be for them for the 100 West 9th Street and it would basically be for the building and the zoning and the sign permit that would be issued. Uh, perhaps maybe not all at the same time, but eventually once the park progresses. So that would be request number one of the council. Any comments, concerns? Any, uh, any dialogue? I'd entertain a motion. So move to waive the fees for the project. Second. Oh, it was Fitzwater, I'm sorry. Okay. I, I caught I caught it that time. <laughs> I vote against it. Oh, can I uh, sure. ask a question? I know we're going to take a break. Well, the setbacks on the sidewalks and everything put it up to what your spec should be? No, that would be my next request. <laughs> I don't want to get ahead of myself. <laughs> You're moving ahead, John. How many items you got on the list? No, I have. Before, we get, before we get into it. The fee waiver. Okay. Okay. Go through it all. All right. Sounds good. Regardless of what we decide on the other items, are we not willing to waive the fee? I mean, do you? Do you? I, I, were you asking I think we're putting, the tables? I think we're. I think we're putting the cart before the horse just a smidgen, maybe. And once we find out everything else, could we table it for a little bit? Well, I, I, I'll withdraw my motion. Thank you, Mark. Just you withdraw the second. Brian, you withdraw your second. I had a motion until second. Yes. Okay. Sorry. So the motion is withdrawn. We're withdrawn. <laughs> awesome. Please tell us what's all on the list. We have. Um, the drawing that you see, I'll, I'll refer back to the drawing real quick and explain a few things. Your city municipal code requires um, that all sidewalks are built adjacent, adjoining the lot line in uh, layman's terms. So basically you build the sidewalk, it has to be five feet wide, and it has to set adjoining the actual lot line. Um, what this does in the eyes of the law is that that sidewalk sits within your right of way, you own it, and it allows the public to use it um, because it's in your right-of-way. It's in a public right-of-way, so the public can use that sidewalk and they can um, utilize that, you know, that sidewalk. Your code also requires the adjoining property owners to maintain the sidewalk. So that's, um, you know, that's the yin and the yang. So the sidewalks um, are built in the public right-of-way. The city allows those to be there to be a public service for, you know, pedestrian traffic. The adjoining property owners, everybody kicks in to help maintain those sidewalks. It's a yin and the yang of the city municipal code. Think about it that way. In 
the placement of the sidewalk being adjoining a lot line, that also gives you the relative placement of your tree lawn, which is also another city service as far as aesthetic beauty of, of um, you know, of the city streets. Your right-of-ways typically run from 60 to 66 foot wide. I mean, they vary, every street varies, but that would be a very common right-of-way here in the city. Ninth Street is 66 feet wide. Um, that's also where you put your public utility, so that's where your sewer, your water, your storm sewers, your uh, fiber optic lines can go, um, buried cable, you name it. That's your right-of-way is typically the place where those type of utilities will go. In the case of um, the plans for the park, you can see that the drawing, I went ahead and I color coded the lawn. You can see at the very bottom of this diagram is four feet wide. A tree lawn is typically, um, depending on the age of the sidewalk, typically eight to 10 feet. Um, the older sidewalks don't tend to be five feet wide. So you can have anywhere from an eight to 10 foot um, tree lawn. And that of course, accompanies the roots of the trees and allows them not to tear up the roads and that type of thing. In this particular drawing, um, what the planners have proposed is a four foot tree lawn. They have gone to the tree board and they requested that no trees be planted in this area and mostly for uh, demonstration purposes of any type of activity in the park. If Ninth Street were to be closed off because um, some type of activity were occurring in the park, then there could be um, people who were there to enjoy those festivities on Knight Street and they could see into the park without having the trees in their way. So uh, from my understanding, the tree board has agreed to this. And so you can see the four foot tree lawn um, there. There was then planned a five foot sidewalk. And then there's another five to six feet before the property line, which is where the request tonight comes from. Your code requires all of those sidewalks to be adjoining the lot line, and if it's not, a special request can be made to the plan commission for the sidewalk to be placed in a different area. Uh, typically, this pops up when you have um, maybe a tree that's sitting on the property line, and the sidewalk has to go around it, or maybe some type of utility that's sitting there that the sidewalk has to veer around. In this case, the plan commission did discuss it last night, they um, normally how I would handle these types of situations is I would come to you first and ask you for your opinion because you own the right of way and then I would take it to uh, the plan commission and I would say okay the city council has given their blessing and you know these were the comments from the city council and according to the municipal code it's it's your authority that has to ultimately approve this and let them have their discussion based on that. We had to go a little bit um, backwards this time because I know that they would like to get started and um, the concrete um, contractor is a week, uh, 70, 10 days behind, or at least he was last week. <laughs> um, so it worked out better that they couldn't start, but they really wanted to start doing um, some earth moving yesterday. Um, so I went to the planning commission last night. I did recommend that they approve it with the city council with a condition the city council also approve it because you own the right of way and they wholeheartedly agreed. Um, they also understood my concern where that comes from not being able to speak to you first. So the three conditions that they uh, had a discussion about and they put in their motion was number one, the sidewalk placement is approved by the city council. Number two, that no parking is allowed on the south side of the park along 9th Street. They were very concerned about the safety of um, pedestrians and children being in that park, running in between cars, whether it was parallel parking or um, angled parking. They definitely were not in favor of the angled parking just because of the narrow street at 9th Street. And so they asked for that to be a condition, no parking allowed on that south side, which you can see in this drawing. The committee did not have, they did pull that parking out um, after these concerns were brought to light. And then the third request would be that the park be owned by the city of Rochester with 18, within 18 months. Um, obviously this is not a typical request because there is no obstacles in the way for the sidewalk to be moved. And um, so what they do however own the, if they understand that if the city were to own the park they also own the right of way. So the movement of that sidewalk um, you know, would be up to the city. So they would like to have, um, they would like to know that the park would be owned by the city in 18 months if it is moved, so. Yeah, it, it's a situation that uh, is a little unusual. Mm -hmm. Normally when we're dealing with these things, we're talking about a private or property owner and uh, the local ordinances and such. This is going to be a 
city-owned park at some point. And you have asked for some latitude on some of these things because the things that a property owner would come and play with aren't going to happen uh, with the park. And there is an agreement. Right now, the LLC owns it, the FEDCO group, and uh, we'll continue to own it until the park's completed, and then it'll be turned over to the city. And the the other side of this request would be uh, the Planning Commission did not have any authority over this, but I need the City Council's approval on the fact that there will be components of the park within your right-of-way. The All of the codes, whether they're a City Municipal Code or Zoning Code or your building codes, all deal with the constraints of lot lines. In this particular case, this lot is 41.25 feet wide. And the components that you can see, the blue line around this diagram is the lot line. So this is giving you the demonstration of that 41.25. There's another five foot of components of this park that sit within your 66 foot right of way. And for the permit, I need your approval to allow um, not only the landscaping that is a part of the park, I mean, it's not just someone planting daisies by their mailbox type of a thing. This is actually a part of the park. They um, have also have proposed plans for the fencing, the historic fencing that Mr. Peterson donated uh, to be allowed to put up. You can see I coded it green. Uh, the squiggle lines that are green that go in between the blue lot line between your sidewalk and within that lot, um, the majority of this fencing would be setting within your right of way within that five foot between the sidewalk and the lot line. So I need the council's approval uh, to be able to put those minutes in my file so that later on, um, no matter what happens with this lot, if someone comes in and gets the plans for it because maybe they want to build a pavilion or they want to do something, they understand that they can't build that pavilion on the edge of what they perceive as the lot line because they'll perceive the sidewalk as the lot line. Um, and they need to understand that the sidewalk is not the lot line. The minutes prove that the city just granted approval for this landscaping and a fence, and that is it. Everything that needs to be built within the 41.25 feet unless an additional approval is given. Casey, do you have any idea what, where <coughs> those lines that are underground now run? Or will they be under the lawn? the street lawn portion and the sidewalk, or do we have utilities that run under those that other five feet you're asking for the variance? It, the question becomes, what happens if that has to be torn up? Because there's a lot of park mm -hmm. that would have to be redone if somebody had to access something under that area my guess uh, there has not been an 811 locate done yet to my knowledge uh, because they have not started yet my guess would be there is nothing in that five feet currently and the reason why I say that is because if you go out to the site where the existing asphalt is that people have been parallel parking on um, from there to the north property line was building, was building. and it was just it was recently excavated and what the, the what you see is fill. So everything from that current asphalt to that north line has been dug out. So my guess, and again, it's just a guess, is that there is not a utility under that currently. I know the water tap is about mid lot on the east line, if I remember correctly, because I believe it was yes. it was running and they had to seal right. it at one point. Right. So yeah, we we know where that is. We right. Know where the uh, storm sewer situation is. And the electric yeah, comes in on, sewer, yeah. Sewer, gas comes in off of Ninth Street. Street, and then the electric comes on off of the north side in the alley, like toward the alley, uh, where you see uh, the privacy fence diagram, right back here by the barrier-free parking space. This is where the the pole is for the electrical. So you have electrical, gas, and the tap not in that area, the water tap. Is the blue line, is that where, on the, the south side, is that the, the current boundary between the fill and whatever concrete or pavement is there? No, the blue line you see on here would be 
the lot line. That would be right. this. I understand that. But, but no, <laughs> the asphalt would be the gray, the yeah. north side of the sidewalk, the gray okay. you see here. Um, and we actually went out and measured this. Dave Carr and my inspectors and I actually went out and we measured the right of way to the best of our ability from Walgreens side over. Then we also measured, um, we measured in a couple different areas by the rule of thumb, trying to find the right of way without a survey. That's all we can do. But we were pretty close to our mark where we were um, thinking that the property line was on the north side and where you see the um, north side of that gray area um, that is approximately where that asphalt is currently located. Now the one thing you need to keep in mind is with the sidewalk shifted five foot to the south, your sidewalks are not going to line up. You have an existing sidewalk that um, is a what is commonly known as is RTC's parking lot to the west of this park. Um, there is the Centennial Park, there's an alley, and then there is the city owns a small area of parking. It's, a, it's about seven parking lots, and then the rest of it RTC owns. And there is an existing sidewalk there with a brick wall. Um, that sidewalk will actually set um, to the north of this one just a little bit. So it will come in over here. So you'll have kind of a catty corner jog in this um, the alley is right this sidewalk ends at the alley yeah and, and she makes a point that was something i didn't realize the city owns seven parking places there in the mm -hmm. rtc lot so those uh, at least four of those will be dedicated to the uh, centennial park parking so the mother who wants to take her children to the park for lunch or whatever has a place to park yeah. along with the parking places there at the will leave 9th Street completely vacant of any parking. We figured it up when we were looking at the parking, um, the seven, the three on site, and then there are two in close proximity on Main Street as well. So you really would have um, 10 to 11 parking spaces for the general public and you have one barrier free spot on the actual lot itself. That's a good point, Ted, because they they have planned to put a grid. Um, it's a grid underneath this section here, and basically it'd be under the sod to maintain the weight of any type of portable stage or food truck that would be pulled on there. Um, we kind of jostled around a few ideas about having that area be pavers or be some type of stamped concrete or something that would match um, the ideas of the park and. Um, one of the contractors stated they did have a metal mesh that they can put under that sod to where it could sustain the weight. Um, so. Well, you know, whenever you start a project like this, first of all, you have a limited area to deal with, a very limited area, and you don't realize that until you get into the program. So we had lots of ideas for permanent staging and pavilions. And it's not that big of an area, and, and it just keeps, it keeps adding the cost. So we decided that we'll leave that area open, have it prepared to bring portable staging to whatever end, and get your get your programs established. Then at some point down the road, somebody wishes to do something. You know, you may put a pavilion up and put uh, a band up there, and it sounds like an echo chamber. Uh, we don't know. We just uh, we want to take this in a progressive manner, a step by step, to make sure we don't do something wrong. With that being said, there's also a drainage plan. It has been approved, mm -hmm. and it's quite doable. We, uh, we think it, it can be done for a minimal cost. So we're still looking at a completed park around $120,000, $125,000 the way it is today. May I say something? Sure. Well, I have two things, actually. Um, the first thing I would say is I'm coming from the ADA coordinator for the city. My concern by offsetting these sidewalks, first of all, first and foremost is, is yes, you're coming up to an alley, but now you're offsetting a, uh, for somebody who may be disabled or in a wheelchair or otherwise not able to motor as easily, you're coming up to a sidewalk and now you're making them turn and go back this way instead of being able to go straight across. Depending on your motor skills at that point, that may be okay, it may not be. Uh, that is my first concern. 
as the ADA coordinator that we are offsetting a sidewalk, a five foot wide sidewalk in the middle of our downtown in a very busy area. Uh, Walgreens, is, that is highly traveled from foot traffic. Um, the other concern I would have is um, currently this is, this is privately owned, this particular project. It is not owned by the city yet. Um, I would have concerns that if we don't adhere to what our current codes say and have this part stay within the boundaries that has been placed, you're setting a precedence. And we need to be cautious of that moving forward. Just noting, understanding everything would be documented, everything would be there, but down the road, if somebody were to, if, if 50 years down the road, we have a developer comes in and says, I'll pay you a million dollars for that lot because I've got a fabulous <coughs> idea. So. Sell, but now you've got, an issue, you've got a right of way issue, and you have now you have completely eliminated the opportunity for them to have any kind of parallel parking, because if you eliminate this for for a park, this is fine, but you you have taken away an opportunity for them to be able to have. I, I agree with not having angled parking right there. It was always a hazard, you know, growing up. I can remember that that parallel parking, but or I'm sorry, angled parking, but to put in a parallel parking section on Na Ninth Street right there wouldn't be as offensive as long as it stayed far enough away from Main Street and pulling into that crosswalk intersection. The other challenge I see from an ADA perspective is, is just like Casey said, we have two sidewalks adjoining. We have our Main Street sidewalk, we have our Ninth Street sidewalk. Right now, they mesh and they meet because they were designed that way. By implementing something like this, now I don't know what kind of effect that's gonna have on that particular crosswalk at that intersection. Well, they're still gonna meet. Um, they will. Have an issue with, I don't know if we will have an issue with NDOT because you will you adjoin to a, a state highway, oh. two state highways actually right there. And I looked at that actually this morning, and the ramp may have to be redone on that corner um, because of, of how far back the sidewalk's going to set. I think this sidewalk's going to intersect the ramp, and the ramp is sloped <clears throat> north and south. It, it's not a fanned ramp where the east and west would carry you down gradually the way you're supposed to. You know, you're going to come up to it and then it'll be a, a depression because the ramp is actually going this way. So you're going to come up to the edge that's <coughs> up. Um, so the ramp, I saw that this morning when I went by and was looking at it. It may have to be redone. I don't know. I didn't measure. But shot is right. That may be something that would have to be looked at. I believe. They redid the drainage plan and put the basins on the lot. Oh, okay, okay. When they switched out the parking. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But those are just my so. concerns. Uh, again, I think my biggest one, a, the ADA one, that is a big one. And you as the council are the authority on that. If we have ADA concerns or complaints, it has to come to you guys. And this is in the 9th and Main. 9th and Main and the, the down 9th uh, Street when yeah. you get to that alley. Because when you get to that alley, you're, if you offset this by five feet, you've got a five foot offset of that sidewalk. So you would be coming up and then jogging over. Mm -hmm. no. okay. um, you know, my, my, but my other biggest concern is, is, the, is, is setting a precedent of, of, of not making, the, not keeping ourselves in check and making ourselves stay even, currently it's privately owned, but eventually it'll, it, the hope and the plan is that the city will own it. But we should be setting a standard that we're, set, we're staying within our own ordinances in our own codes. Um, that's just my, my concern moving forward, um, that that could raise some, like I said, setting a precedence down the road to, to bring that park out. As beautiful as it is, it's a beautiful design. All the designs have been been pretty, I, I think, that I have seen. Um, but just something to think about as you guys have your discussion on, on how to move forward with this. Any idea, Casey, why it, why it was drawn in violation of the code? I mean, is it the intent was just to make the park as big as possible in that space? I believe, I don't believe they knew the code. Um, I actually didn't get into the, the nitty gritty as far as seeing a final, I've seen multiple um, drafts throughout the last year 
Um, but most of the time when they were brought in, it was speaking of one component. You know, we're thinking of having a stage. What do I have to do for that? So we would talk about that. We, I'm thinking of an ADA ramp. If it's depressed 24 inches or 18 inches, what do I do with that? So I was always talking about one component versus another. And, and the first time I'd seen a final plan was um, when they brought it in for the permits. And that really started the... Uh, going through it with a fine tooth comb, unfortunately, at that point. So I don't think that they really knew that that code was in there. My office enforces that, and we hadn't gone over it. Um, but when I asked them why it was uh, pulled back to the south, that was uh, the response, is they wanted to make the park as large as they could um, for the facility. have to work with what we have though yeah John said we can't just expand because we want to that's my concern especially if, if the plans don't follow through and for, for some unforeseen reason the city does not take over the space I can foresee that as being a problem down the road for other areas and if you think of it in terms of one of the other areas we've talked about as being a pocket park in our downtown would be in an area that would be like in the middle of two buildings at that point you are forced to stay within your boundary you know, this one, fortunately or unfortunately, is on a corner. So you have the ability to take that boundary and push it out. Um, I, I, I'm just, with in light of all of these conversations that Ted and I have been involved in in the last couple of months with other things coming up from past practices, I just don't want us to be in a situation where 10, 20, 30, 50 years down the road, a council and a clerk treasurer are sitting here having this conversation about the choices that we made back then because it's affecting a, a potential decision for the future. Does that make sense? So we'd have to bring the sidewalk back, encroach into the park area with the sidewalk and line up. The blue line. The sidewalk would have to be pulled to the blue line. And um, yeah, it wouldn't encroach into the, the park area. The park area need, would need to be shrunk five feet. Well, I think there's plenty of lawn area. You know, it can be condensed, if that was your wish. Well, you would have a larger lawn and move the sidewalk up. Right. This, yeah, right. I think they want to do a lawn out there and make that lawn wider. Yeah. And we still have the tree board saying yeah, you would have we're not going to put trees up. Mm -hmm. Well, no, if we're going to change it, we'll put trees in. But, <laughs> <laughs> That's a different board, Brian. Yeah. But I think, <laughs> I think also if we, if, for Casey's purpose, <laughs> This makes her job a lot easier by saying if you stay within the guidelines of the code, then you guys, the only thing you really have on the table is the fee waiver or the permit fee waiver. Would yeah. that be correct? We, right. If we go back to that blue line, we're just creating a bigger lawn area. A bigger tr a tree lawn, lawn and mm -hmm. then your these area these areas here would just shore up five feet. You know, you'd see this these landscaped areas pull. Hold up. No, the tree lawn would be. So all of this oh. would be green. Okay. Yeah, because, you know, and I'm thinking in terms of I have two small kids. And if I take my kids to that park, I would much rather have an extra couple, three feet of grass because they children tend to run to grass. They don't want to play on concrete. So I'm thinking. It's a busy enough intersection that gives just an, uh, an added buffer of off of the sidewalk before, the street. before mm -hmm. you hit that street. Um, you would have a tree lawn of nine feet total, right? And then you would have a sidewalk of five feet, and then the park pavers and landscaping would begin. Yeah, I don't think that's a huge issue. I don't think that can happen. It looks like it's workable. Okay. Well, that increases our ADA, and I'm thinking too in terms of the ADA. Also, we're not going to be running into too much tear up in the front quadrant. The Main Street ramp, I think, was just done five five years ago. So when we started everything, um, yeah. and it would still be in compliance, right. you know, if everything and shifted. Back, the back sidewalk meshing up, they line up now, and you're not. I, I, like I said, I, I see things a little different being 88, 14. Moving back, <laughs> moving back with the blue line eliminates a lot of potential issues. So I don't think that's a big deal. 
it's your project manager may jump up and down the screen and yell and say, this is version 12. I'm going to let you make those phone calls. You know, I, I volunteered to be the representative here. Terry Lee abandoned me. And I know I'm on TV. He can hear me say that. Terry Lee abandoned me to talk about this. Yes, Dave, talk to Ted. This is not me. Don't get mad at me. lawn area that is right there between the sidewalk and the street uh, the owners preferred to leave that tree free mm -hmm. right and the tree board it was taken to the tree board and they approved that I think he was joking Brian was joking <laughs> Brian needs a sign just kidding <laughs> No, Brian needs a sign. Just kidding. Karen, what I will do to confirm that uh, is I will make sure that when I do the minutes for the council meeting that I include that particular verbiage because typically if we go back to review minutes on things, it's usually our council or board of works, typically not tree board or other um, associate boards that we have, so I'll make sure I document that. In I can't ever get it to work. Again, again they're, they're, they're antsy to get the project going, the contractors are. So can we get a motion to approve the waiver of the fees with the provision that we stay within the uh, uh, guidelines of the, uh, of the, uh, the ordinance? Can we do that? And I'm sure and she'll, she'll watch dog that. And course. what about part three? Do we want to say that we will assume ownership once it's a established part? Well, yeah, I think that we'll have it. And the thing you need to um, keep in mind, I'm trying to find something. I'm not trying to be rude. I apologize. I just don't work with this that often. doesn't like me. Um, the thing you need to keep in mind is if actually the sidewalk is in compliance with your code, then the Planning Commission's decision last night is a moot point. The only reason why the plan, it was taken before the Planning Commission is because it was not in compliance with your code, and they are the body that your code stipulates has to grant that waiver. So if it meets the code, then it's moot. Um, you know, that would be your decision if you wanted to put that condition on it or something. Oh. Does that have the amount here? No. The sign permit is three dollars a square foot and it's based on how large the sign is. And I don't have any plans on that, so I I'm not sure. Then normally what we do, your uh, sidewalk permit with the electrical and plumbing, it would be based on um, the cost of the the estimated cost of that portion of the project, um, or of the project and um, and the number of inspections, because I don't have a square footage because there's no structure, so. So I don't have those numbers. I mean, it's all, it's an equation, but that's how they're figured up. Talking less than $500? Oh my gosh, yeah. Yeah. I, I would be shocked if it hit 100, but <laughs> I shouldn't say that. But <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you're talking electrical, but we don't inspect landscaping. Yeah. So you're, you're talking the minimal plumbing is this the water tap and your sprinkle system which are soaker hoses uh, you know so you have a main line going down the whole thing and then they'll have soaker hoses off of it and your electrical what few outlets um, that you know the electrical will have to be run for the lighting the lighting that's proposed is um, it's all at grade for the most part some of it is actually in the mason um, you know the walls the sitting walls they'll have a uh, lower light but it'll light up the walking paths and then they have some lights that are proposed to be in the landscaping themselves with up lighting into the trees in the landscaping to light uh, the <laughs> landscaping so even the lighting is very minimal and that would be your electrical that the inspectors would check and any outlets exterior outlets and I will say we've, we've waived Mm -hmm. 
Council of Aging, Lions Club, I mean, the city, the county, all the towns that we've done it for multiple nonprofits. I'll say less than, you know what, I'll say less than 200 just to make sure I'm safe. How's that? I don't know how big their sign's going to be. You're talking about a property that's then actually going to become an asset of the city. Mm -hmm. Much larger enhancement to the park program than two hundred dollars. Right. Yeah. I would, uh, I would entertain a motion then to waive the fees uh, with the, the terms that we stayed uh, within the ordinance stipulation for design. And so you're not including the ownership in, in what oh, you well, want. yes, in the ownership uh, uh, statement. I have a suggestion on that. I would suggest that. If it's all in compliance, it's in compliance whether the city owns it or a private individual owns it. It will always be in compliance. So, and in reality, the city will have possession of that long before 18 months, but we, we don't need it in the, in the motion. So, you're asking for a motion to waive the fees uh, with the stipulation that the park be done within code of. City municipal guns. Yeah, yeah, I think so. <laughs> <laughs> and be. I'll get it in the minutes, right? Okay. I, mean, that a motion? I, I will make that motion. Second. Those in favor signify by raising your right hand. <laughs> Raise your right hand. That's five. Mason's like, I don't get it. I said, do we even need that though? Because if we didn't approve the. Well, it's just waving the fees. Yeah. 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 That's all we that's all we're doing. Yeah. We're doing. Yeah. Well, yeah. Yeah. but I needed a decision on whether or not it needs to be within the 41.25 feet or within the plan that's been proposed to me with the permits. So, I mean, I'm glad you put it in there because I need everybody to be clear that either it's within the lot lines or they're able to extend into the 66 foot right away. So, thank you. 41.25 feet. 41.25 feet. Line. Stay in the blue line. Uh, the wall situation. Enid Tate and I are working on a memorandum of understanding for the control of the wall. Uh, she owns the wall. She owns the building. Uh, the, the MOU uh, that we're looking at, kicking back and forth, we can get through. We can get back to it. Basically says there will be uh, discussion between building owner and the city on any anything that goes to the wall. She says she wants to be a good uh, steward in regards to that. And I said we just don't we don't want to see chew mail pouch tobacco show up on the, the wall something like that. She I like oh, no, 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 no. Oh, that's cool. You know what that's very interesting very cool. topic so <laughs> very so down there. Yeah. Henry yeah. Cigar. Henry Cigar is even so good. So so that that's in the process. Okay. Uh, the uh, uh, yeah. the uh, the calcium condition, the white condition, it looks like we've gotten that looks a lot better. We've gotten that under control. Uh, it has been treated with special chemical for uh, for that type of a condition, based again on the mortar that was used, the heavy duty mortar. And I think we've got that retarded. Yes. So. Okay. Um, moving right along, stormwater engineering fees. Uh, we've got That's the, for the additional appropriation for the rainy day fund. Right. That, that ties into resolution 3-2017. Correct. Uh, we're, we're asking for uh, some uh, appropriate some money from the rainy day fund for our engineering uh, folks who have started uh, the process of our storm sewer upgrade uh, that uh, with our Gantt chart uh, we're anticipating completing uh, 
by the end of 2019. Um, and of course that will uh, be financed through a bonding process after we start the, uh, the storm sewer utility program. As I understand, Shot, our, our, our county firm is yet to complete the rate situation and such right. that will be brought to this body to approve. Then we'll get our utility established and uh, the Board of Works will be the, in control of that utility as written by the ordinance. And uh, we'll have a department head just like with the water board and get, get, things, get things moving. Uh, our accountants tell us after uh, several months of uh, uh, storm sewer payments, if you will, tariffs, if you will, then you show that you have enough monies in reserve to go forth and apply for your bond. So that, that's the process. But right now, we're looking for some monies to help with the uh, preamble, if you will, the engineering parts right now. That's 100, 150. 125, 125 was where I, I'm starting, because we already have, I believe it's 50,000 already appropriated in rainy day. So this would set us at 175,000 available to spend if we need to. But right now, to get us up to the point where we're ready to do bonding, I, I think we're right around that 100 to 130, unless we run into some challenges in between. Chad is looking for a cushion there to help. I us am exactly. I'm just trying to because I don't want to have to keep thing. coming back to you and saying, "Can we do it again? Can we do it again?" <laughs> so I was trying to get it spaced out enough to where it would get us through until we're to that point where bonding. And we can always the conversations we've had. We've I've been very open with the engineering firm on this, just because this is such a, a green project right now and we aren't receiving our revenue and just to give you guys an update I've actually got it on the Board of Works agenda for Thursday as well I have reached out to the county again we uh, John may remember this we reached out to them a few years ago asking about how much it would uh, cost us to add that fee it, it is it's a stormwater fee onto our tax bills uh, rather than send it through a utility billing office and I did get quotes back from the county on that, so we know how much that's gonna cost us to have that done, and we're, you know, the dollars are, it, they're not that much uh, from our perspective to be able to pay the county to say, yes, please take care of that line item. And then the, uh, we've as I included in your packet, there is already an invoice that has came in for engineering fees. So with your approval tonight for me to pay this out of rainy day fund, I will get the this first invoice taken care of, paid out of rainy day to get that ball rolling, as opposed to pulling it from either um, riverboat or wastewater, because uh, those are the two funds right now that we typically take care of stormwater, and <coughs> both of them are a little are starting to get a little shrinkage to them, so I'm trying to protect them too. <laughs> so that's that's what that is for. Um, I don't know, as far as the project moving forward, like I said, we're waiting on the rate study. Uh, once he's got the parcels, I contacted Christina Schreiber, the county auditor. She got him a copy of all of the parcels within the city. Uh, and so he, our accounting firm, is going through and marking the permeable versus non-permeable, um, that type of, so, because that makes a difference on what kind of rate you would apply to that particular service. Yeah, it, it's been an interesting process. We've spent some monies from our budgeting fund uh, that we've had available for some of the preliminary studies like uh, cameras in the areas that we're talking about. We discovered our main storm sewer line going down the middle of Main Street when we have a tenth of an inch of rain because it was raining the day we cameraed it. That uh, pipe is being utilized by 25% with a tenth of an inch of rain. So you can imagine why we flood all over town when we get a downpour. Uh, those, that size pipe was put in when we had cobblestone streets. You talk about permeable areas. We have a whole lot less areas for water to go to now than we did when that sewer was initially put in. So. Uh, I have a question real quick. Yes. Will we all still be moving forward on the sidewalk survey the 
that's maybe the storm right out of the bed. We had we had that conversation with Donahue, and I believe he said that would be part of the project. The but project. I'm not going to guarantee you win. Cool. <laughs> Understood. Yeah. Lots of detail. So, uh, shall we do it as part of the resol as a resolution, or? The, what, what do you mean, as far as the vote? I, I would just jump to, to save time, unless you guys have questions, or I would just jump to your a resolution vote. Sounds like Unless you all have me. questions or comments. It's been a long day. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Councilman Smith, would you, uh, would you want to read resolution 3-2017? Sure. Andy said you don't even have to read it if you don't want to because it's a resolution. Okay. Well, by title. Y'all want to go home? Yeah. I'm going to go to the pizza. Well, I just think it's ironic that we're looking for storm sewer money. It's a rainy day. Yeah. 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 Yeah
you guys have one, you sign it, it goes back to the Redevelopment Commission, and it should be a public hearing, I'm assuming. And so that may be what he meant when what he said- What his time constraint is, mm -hmm. yeah, it's already- Because they always have a timeline whenever <coughs> they give it to the Planning Commission where it says, this date you have it, you know, they we gave it to you and it lists them all. And the Redevelopment Commission meets, they always meet the first Wednesday of the month. So that would be next week. Council folks, it's up to you. Um, you listen, you're capable of it. So you want to act on it tonight or table it? It's up, up to you folks. It doesn't appear to be anything that's of a. I would prefer to act on it. And if we don't, then I would suggest we do a special meeting mm -hmm. to, Sounds like to, to do this to, mm -hmm. in order to, to that keep there time, time constraints. What do you think, Councilman Garrett? Which I don't, I'm not. I just don't like to get rid of those individuals, and all of a sudden, you know, it's not on the agenda, and then it comes in, and you just throw it in front of everybody's face tonight, and then, hey, hurry up and make a decision on this. I, I don't like to do that. Let's have a 15 minute, half hour special meeting. That's just fine with me. Okay. So. Uh, let me, I will email Terry and see what his, does new, give me a time. Does new work for everybody with lunch schedules? I know Mason's out on Thursdays. Um, I mean, does that seem to work with everybody if I try to schedule like a noon lunch mm -hmm. or 11? Within the next then, couple days. Yeah. 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 I'll get a military. Yeah. yeah the next, because we've got to give 48 hours notice for media. Right. Can I use this, Christy? Did she? <laughs> <laughs> Can I use this as my 48 hours notice? <laughs> um, so, but I, I'll do, I'll work. I'm out tomorrow with, uh, with my dad. But I can. Work, I'll be working from Goshen, so I'll shoot out emails and see what I can get coordinated, and then get times out with you guys what works with Terry's schedule. How about noon Friday, the thirty first? Does that work? Just, okay. stop, just stop in here for fifteen to twenty minutes. I will be out of town. Twelve o'clock. Twelve o'clock. Is it a, right at twelve o'clock on Friday? Problems with let me know. Well, if there's enough other people to do it, then that's not a problem. Yeah. yeah. Probably an L card is loving that thing. Okay. <coughs> I would entertain a motion to adjourn. I'd like to thank my neighbors for coming, for coming tonight. Good to see you. I really have to see him. I'm glad you came here tonight. You came here. We verify yeah. that he's on the yeah. yeah. He has to do his job. Yeah. Good to see you guys. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, I entertain a motion to adjourn. I already got John down for making the motion. Okay, I'll second. I'll second that. Mason seconds it to the favor. I just grabbed the name out of the, out of the sky. Thank you, folks. Kind of a long meeting tonight. Thank you very much. Keep going. 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 Keep